Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, joining me uh, uh, here at the uh, Foreign Press Center. Um, as was mentioned, I'm here chiefly to speak about the International Science and Technology Center. Uh, but before I get into to some of the details related to what I think is a very great example of the international work that the United States does with a number of partners, including uh, countries uh, that uh, are represented here uh, around the table, uh, I wanted to, to say a few things about the uh, State Department's nonproliferation uh, mission. Um, the Department of State has a long and storied tradition of working on a robust global engagement on nonproliferation issues. Uh, that engagement continues today as we work closely with our partners throughout the interagency to ensure that the United States government is an integrated approach across all agencies. So I oversee the State Department's nonproliferation assistance as it relates to dealing with chemical, biological, and nuclear threats, but I work very closely with the Department of Defense and the Department of Agents and the Department of Energy as well as uh, several other uh, agencies. It's our mission to lead efforts to prevent the spread of weapons of mass destruction, their related materials and delivery systems, and advanced conventional weapons. So it's a very big uh, job that the international community works together on. Um, there's a fundamental United Nations Security Council resolution uh, that all your governments are supportive of and have signed on to, UN Security Council Resolution 1540 that codifies um, all the different areas that contribute to activity uh, to stem the flow of weapons of mass destruction. And so um, it's a pleasure to, to work uh, on some of those uh, elements. Uh, under the umbrella of cooperative threat reduction, the United States is pleased to support and partner with the countries of the International Science and Technology Center. This multilateral, intergovernmental, and international organization is better equipped now than ever uh, to mitigate 21st century uh, global threats. When I mention the ISTC, I'll refer to the, the, the International Science and Technology Center as the ISTC, I'm referring to a specific type of work on nonproliferation that has to do with the human element of proliferation. In other words, the expertise that exists around the world uh, for uh, uh, dual-use science, so um, expertise that can be used both for important civilian pursuits, but at the same time to develop weapons programs. Um, and there's an interest internationally in dealing with that expertise and ensuring that it is not used for nefarious purposes. Now, the foremost institution that deals with this particular mission is the ISTC, and last week I was pleased to be in Astana, in Kazakhstan, to initial the new agreement um, uh, of the uh, continuing the ISTC, uh, which has now moved its headquarters from Moscow to Astana, and it is going to continue its very important work from uh, Astana with a number of uh, key uh, partners. This particular agreement that we initialed, which still needs to be signed, we hope to sign it in December, is the result of over three years of intensive work by the ISTC parties, including the government of Kazakhstan, uh, Tajikistan, uh, uh, Armenia, and a number of other uh, countries that are members. Since its creation in 1994, the ISTC has supported some 700 projects worth almost $1 billion in the former Soviet Union. Projects have focused on biological, chemical, and nuclear nonproliferation and been both bilateral and regional in nature. Changes in the ISDC membership have required the organization to find a new home to continue the center's work. In keeping with its commitment to nonproliferation and global security, the government of Kazakhstan answered the call for a new host state. We are fortunate the ISDC will have a home in a nation that has been very committed to the center in advancing our shared nonproliferation agenda. The work of the ISDC is as important as it was when it was founded 20 years ago. Weapons of mass destruction remain a real threat to our shared security, advances in science, as you can imagine, and increasing interest from terrorists make this an issue that transcends the state-to-state -state model that once prevailed. 
Fortunately, the ISTC's multilateral nature and flexibility make it an instrumental tool in mitigating those emerging threats. The continuing agreement, which fa will facilitate the future work of the ISTC, based at Nazarbayev University in Astana. Thanks are also due to the staff of the ISTC that have worked to transform the ISTC into a new center for nonproliferation, science, and technology. I look forward, uh, as I have in the past, to working with the current members of the ISTC to sign the agreement, but also to expanding the organization to new countries beyond its current uh, membership. Moving from the ISTC, I wanted to say a few words that will be of interest uh, to you and to the, the, the countries that you're from with which we partner very closely. Another program that the State Department sponsors uh, globally is our counter-nuclear smuggling activity. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Bureau that I work for is involved in strengthening international capabilities to counter the illicit trafficking of nuclear and other radiological materials. Real cases of nuclear smuggling indicate that additional materials may be still available in illegal circulation. For example, specifically, cases of weapon-usable nuclear material seized in Moldova in 2011 and Georgia in 2010 underscore the need for strengthened international cooperation to detect nuclear smuggling networks and secure trafficked materials. To that end, the ISN Bureau's Office of Weapons of Mass Destruction Terrorism has forged strong partnerships with a number of countries through bilateral joint action plans, which outlines area where, areas where we can work together to prevent, detect, and respond to nuclear smuggling. Through this work, the United States is carrying out a number of projects to improve counter-nuclear smuggling capabilities, especially by promoting strengthened coordination and training among law enforcement and technical experts. Law enforcement in many of the countries represented at the table and in some of the countries we work with have a very important role in going after these networks of smugglers. For example, we are working closely with the government of Kazakhstan to support its efforts to develop a training curriculum on countering nuclear trafficking for an, or a, a, uh, an institute it has created called the Nuclear Security Training Center in Alatau. This curriculum will be focused on raising awareness among frontline law enforcement officers about the threat of nuclear trafficking and methods to effectively detect, interdict, and secure material outside of regulatory control. While the specific cooperation is more recent, we signed an agreement to work on these issues with Kazakhstan in 2006. I was also in Ukraine last week where I, dis I led discussions with the Ukrainian government to review our cooperation on this same issue of counter-nuclear smuggling based on an agreement that we have with the Ukrainian government that dates back to 2006. Over the years, Ukraine has strengthened its ability to also detect and respond to nuclear smuggling at dozens of border crossings and other ports of entry, partly with U.S. support, partly using its own resources. I know we have some colleagues uh, or a colleague here from Armenia. I wanted to mention, for example, the United States and Armenia signed a counter-nuclear smuggling joint action plan in July of 2008, which identified a range of steps Armenia could take to improve its ability to prevent, detect, and response, respond to nuclear and radiological smuggling. Armenia has made significant progress in this area, including in border security, radiological security, regulatory and legal development in nuclear forensics. We continue to work with Armenia in all these areas. I understand we also have a, a colleague from uh, Georgia. The United States and Armenia signed a counter-nuclear smuggling joint action plan in February of 2007, which also identified a number of areas where Georgia could work with the United States on developing its ability to deal with this problem. Um, Furthermore, we are committed to working with the government of Georgia, which has been an excellent partner uh, in, uh, in this area. Finally, let me close with uh, the area of border security. There are a number of U.S. agencies that work on augmenting border security capabilities in several countries. As I mentioned at the outset, I focus fairly narrowly on nonproliferation, not every aspect of border security, but the U.S. State Department has a program called the Export Control and Related Border Security Program, which provides assistance to over 60 countries in developing their export control 
and border security capabilities. The EXBIS program, as it is known, draws on the expertise of U.S. government agencies, foreign government experts, the private sector, and the academic community to organize over 200 specialized capacity building activities to improve export controls and border security in several areas. First, in the development of comprehensive legal regulatory frameworks to regulate trade in proliferation sensitive dual use items and enforce these laws. In very simple terms, we worry about and work with partner countries to regulate the proliferation of high-end material that could be used both for civilian commercial purposes um, and to increase uh, commerce and, and the benefits from commerce, but could also be used as components for dangerous weapons. And so we work with many countries to make sure that they have a legal system in place uh, and the, the uh, processes and protocols to identify those materials and to prevent them from being um, uh, from uh, transiting uh, their country. We've worked uh, closely, for example, in Tajikistan to develop a new law uh, to, to control these items. Uh, we worked in 2014 to support the passage of a similar law in Serbia. Uh, EXPIS is currently working, for example, uh, with Afghanistan, Kenya, Morocco, Mongolia, and the Philippines uh, on the development of their draft strategic trade control legislation. For example, in the ASEAN region, two countries have developed strategic trade control uh, laws, uh, Singapore and Malaysia, and we are very hopeful that other countries, including the Philippines, will be able to develop uh, this uh, legislation uh, and uh, conclude and implement such legislation. Second, establishment of effective licensing procedures and practices that apply to export, transit, transshipment, brokering, and financial transactions involving controlled goods are also a goal of ours. Uh, in June 2014, for example, uh, this program supported a study visit for the Thai uh, licensing officials to South Korea. And I know we have some uh, friends from South Korea here today to learn more about the Republic of Korea's licensing system called Yes Trade. Such exchanges promote regional harmonization of strategic trade control best practices and facilitate development of peer to peer networks among non proliferation practitioners. Third, the EXPIS program supports activities that bolster partner governments' outreach to their strategic industry sectors, including exporters, freight forwarders, and shippers. For example, in 2014, the State Department facilitated a two-day outreach workshop with Armenian industry and government to discuss proliferation risks facing Armenia and illustrate the need for and value of internal compliance best practices for Armenian exporters of dual-use goods. The event resulted in the Armenian uh, Ministry of, Econo of Economy's policy guidance on internal compliance programs to be published this year. Fourth, strengthening enforcement at and between points of entry on the border. The EXPIS program provides training on detection, inspection, interdiction, and disposal of controlled items, as well as the investigation and prosecution of violations. EXPIS also donates state-of-the-art detection and equipment uh, to partner governments. For example, as many of you may know, EXPIS is strengthening the capacity of Syria's neighbors to stop illicit transfers by training frontline border security officials to identify dual use weapons of mass destruction components in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. In this area, we work closely with international organizations such as the World Customs Organization uh, to encourage adoption of better enforcement practices, including automated advanced manifest data collection and automated targeting. It's important for me to mention that these are not simply bilateral programs. We work to universalize this approach to strategic trade controls, and there are international organizations that are very much focused on this mission. Finally, as with all issues that face our governments, we support inter better interagency cooperation, information sharing, and international collaboration among partner nations. We held, uh, the State Department host, or held an international export control conference in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates in March of 2014. 2014. The event brought together 313 participants from 74 countries. To illustrate the benefits of international cooperation, 
Expis joins efforts with other international donors. For example, I mentioned Georgia. Georgia's 2014 law on the control of military and dual-use products is the result of a five-year joint effort between Expis and the European Union's outreach program on dual-use goods. Expis assistance helps provide improved decision-making on dual-use transfer requests, harmonization of national export control systems with international standards, and reduction in the risk of illicit trade and trafficking. The impact of Expis assistance is evident since 2004. The UN Security Council 1540 Committee has issued several reports documenting measures taken by states to implement their export control obligations. It has found that many authorities have established or altered their export control systems to reflect their obligations under 1540. There are many partners of the United States and of the State Department specifically uh, who have improved their systems, including Armenia, Georgia, India, Jordan, Kosovo, Malaysia, Mexico, Serbia, Thailand, and the United uh, Arab uh, Emirates. Uh, let me stop here. I've covered a wide range of ground, going for uh, starting with the work that we've done to address the potential uh, risk posed by dual use expertise on the human capital side, as I would describe it. Um, I've also talked about a specific program aimed at uh, reducing the threat posed by uh, nuclear material smuggling. And third, I talked a little bit about border security in a specialized area. Um, the U.S. government collectively works on a number of additional related areas to do with nuclear security, biological security, uh, and chemical security, and I'm happy to get into those a little bit as well. But let me stop here um, and turn it to back As here. we move to the Q&A portion of the event, I'd ask folks to please uh, state your name and publication, and also we're going to try and give go around the table and give uh, every country and outlet a chance to get a question before we take multiple questions from the same journalist. So, who has our, we'll go right here. My name is Ozeki, I work for Japan Um As far as uh, ISTC is concerned, um, I'm ashamed how little I know about this issue, but uh, a few people do. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't it, in the first place, wasn't it because of the Russian withdrawal that you had to uh, come up with a new agreement? Um, why? What's the Russians' claim? I mean, wh why do they claim that they are dropping out of this uh, agreement? And what's the impact? And what are the concerns? Uh, it's a it's an excellent uh, question and a very common question. I'd start by saying that um, the ISTC has had a very strong partnership with Rus Russian scientists and more broadly. Uh, scientists throughout the former Soviet Union since the mid-90s when there was a strong sense of collaboration uh, on addressing the threat posed by the proliferation of this dual-use expertise. Um, the United States and I dare say the other members of the governing board of the ISTC had hoped and continue to hope that Russia would remain a part of the ISTC and contribute to working on problems of, a, of an international nature. Um, the ISTC, as I mentioned, is an international organization uh, with a number of countries that fund projects aimed at developing strong science and uh, encouraging good partnerships with a number of institutes throughout uh, the, 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 the region. Um, I, uh, I and, and I think my colleagues in the ICC were disappointed uh, to get the news that the Russian government had decided uh, to uh, leave the ISTC. I believe there is a difference of opinion um, that is clear between Russian scientists and some of the technical experts that we work with in Russia and the Russian government itself. And I believe from some of the informal conversations that I have had and others of my international colleagues have had, is that if they'd had a choice, a number of those Russian institutes, institutions, and scientists would have preferred to stay involved uh, as uh, uh, members of the ISTC. Unfortunately, we respect the decision of the Russian government to leave. Um, I would refer you to the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for any comments that they may have on the Russian decision. Uh, but as of the middle of July, Russia will effectively have left the ISTC. Um, as the United States representative to the ISTC governing board, I have said and will continue to say that Russia is welcome to rejoin it sometime in the future. 
Um, uh, the ISTC is not a political organization. It's a technical organization aimed at improving uh, national security. Uh, and uh, uh, the ISTC and Russian uh, scientists have benefited from that partnership. And uh, we can only express our disappointment that, uh, that Russia has left at this point. What's the impact? Why are you disappointed? Uh, because, as I mentioned, there are a lot of Russian scientists that were pursuing important work with the ISTC, um, I think both to their benefit, uh, because they were uh, part of a broader network uh, that exposed them uh, to science, scientific practices, and expertise from the other members of the ISTC. Uh, my fear is that uh, the Russian government's departure from the ISTC further isolates uh, what is a very significant and important community of experts who have a lot to offer to their neighbors and to some of the other members of the ISTC, like Japan, like Korea, like the United States, um, like Tajikistan, like the European Union that are all uh, members. Um, so, uh, you know, Russia obviously has significant expertise and for it to leave the organization is disappointing. Now, it, it isn't uh, changing the course of the ISTC. The ISTC is effectively now moved to Kazakhstan. Its headquarters have moved. Uh, we are looking to acquire new partners and to engage uh, new countries um, and look forward to them joining the ISTC. And as I said, at a future date, we would welcome uh, Russia rejoining the ISTC if it decided to do so. Hi from Kazakhstan. Hello. Hello. Channel Habak of Kazakhstan. Uh, as you know, Nazarbayev University in Astana uh, was <coughs> named a uh, new ISTC uh, office location. Uh, what does, uh, how does uh, the United States uh, to, con uh, to continue <coughs> cooperation uh, with Kazakh government? What do you think about that? Well, uh, let me start by just expressing my great appreciation for the government of Kazakhstan's decision to host the headquarters of the ISDC. I've had a number of opportunities um, to speak to, to the Kazakh government um, uh, representative to the ISDC and also in the, the, the different ministries that are active in the ISDC, the science ministry, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been very active. Um, I've met with uh, the Kazakh ambassador to the United States, and it was a very important decision that the government of Kazakhstan made to host the ISDC. Um, I'm also very pleased that Nazarbayev University was identified as a specific location uh, to host the ISDC because Nazarbayev University has a very important role in promoting the development um, and scientific progress of Kazakhstan and some of the evolution that Kazakhstan is, 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 is going through. And so for us to have an organization that's focused on the future, to be hosted at Nazarbayev University is a, is a beautiful uh, set of circumstances. Um, we um, uh, have a number of additional steps to take. Um, all the, 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 uh, the, the, the countries that are members of the ISTC uh, still need to sign the ISDC framework agreement. We hope to be able to do that in December uh, at a, at a follow-on governing board meeting, which will be held in Astana as well. Um, and we, we are just uh, uh, very uh, supportive of uh, moving that process uh, forward. Um, I would also uh, mention that uh, uh, Kazakhstan and other members of the ISDC have benefited from the cooperation with the ISDC both from a scientific perspective from, but from an economic perspective as well. Um, the United States and other countries have provided grants to scientists from the different members of the ISTC. Um, and for Kazakhstan specifically, um, it has received over $36 million in uh, uh, assistance through uh, projects funded in the ISTC since the beginning uh, of the creation of the ISTC. Uh, other examples include uh, Armenia, where uh, some $28 million have been spent on scientific grants. Uh, in Kazakhstan, I'm told that over 4,700 scientists have worked with the ISTC, which is a very large number uh, since the mid-90s. Um, I'll give an example. In Georgia, uh, over 2,000 scientists have worked with the ISTC since its creation. Uh, in Tajikistan, a little less, 626. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, a little over 1,300. So 
it is a very large community uh, of experts that we, we work with and hope to broaden that community. One more question. Please. Uh, at second, almost 200 uh, projects have been uh, <coughs> allocated to benefit Kazakhstan's scientists. Uh, what about this year? Uh, what uh, do you think of? So, um, uh, this year, the United States announced two new uh, projects uh, for Kazakhstan. A number of other uh, projects are being funded. Um, I was pleased to announce those projects uh, at the um, um, governing board meeting in Astana uh, last week. Um, we continue to want to partner with Kazakhstan institutes. There are many um, uh, uh, institutes that we work with, including, I'll just give you a couple examples, the National Nuclear Center of the Republic of Kazakhstan, the Institute of uh, Nuclear uh, Physics. Um, and we lead, we've worked on a number of areas from nuclear security to biological security and a lot of areas in between. So uh, we see uh, a bright future and the potential for additional work uh, going forward. Okay. Thank you. From uh, science and technology daily Chinese newspaper. Uh, question simple is uh, I just want uh, uh, what kind of uh, priority field, research field, is, is uh, by the new IT, sorry, ISTC, and uh, which country could be the main uh, donor countries in this organization? Thank you for the, for the, the question. Uh, the ISTC is going through a period of transition. Its focus initially, as I mentioned, was on some of the, uh, uh, on the former weapon scientists and on very basic research and development in science and technology in the early years. What we have noticed is that the scientists that we work with uh, from all the countries in, in, in Central Asia um, and beyond have adapted their focus to current national security challenges, but broaden the types of projects that they work on to areas of health, environmental uh, safety, um, global warming, uh, uh, and, and a number of areas. I'll give you one example. Uh, the government of Japan funded a project to look at the impact of Fukushima and some of the damage caused by that. Uh, unfortunate um, incident. Um, but to me, that's an important example of an organization created a, long, a fairly long time ago adjusting itself to dealing with current problems today and funding scientists from some of these countries looking at problems that exist in their countries. So, for example, in Tajikistan, where there is a, uh, a very deadly health legacy uh, related uh, to uh, nuclear testing. Uh, in the former Soviet Union, and there remains uranium tailings and environmental damage. Um, there have been projects to assess some of uh, the, the, the health effects and the uh, cleanup that one can do or, or that, that, that is being done uh, of the, the uranium tailings. So there's a broad range of science and, and expertise that is being brought to bear, and a new a set of ideas that are being fostered. The ISDC, I should also mention, has a mechanism to assess the scientific project. So we don't just fund anything. Any not, not every project has merit. It is also based on the resources we have available. But we try to focus the, the uh, scientific projects and the grants on current and important uh, 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 scientific projects. In terms of membership, um, we are still having a number of internal discussions about uh, which countries to engage, uh, which countries could potentially join. But the ISTC is open to all countries that have an interest in this particular uh, mission. Um, we, we are looking for countries that are both strong partners, that have a, a scientific base that would be interested in partnering with the scientists that are, member, that, uh, are part of the countries that are members of the ISTC. Um, but we are also, and, and as you can imagine, interested in donor countries that are looking to fund projects. And currently, the United States has fairly regularly funded projects. Uh, Japan has as well, the European Union as well, uh, the Republic of Korea has as well. Um, 
having a country like China express interest in the ISTC would, of course, be uh, very much welcome, uh, along with uh, other countries like uh, Singapore, uh, or perhaps, why not, more broadly, uh, in other parts of the world. Okay, go. Yeah, this is Borelli with People's Daily. Uh, my question is, you mentioned about Ukraine. So has the crisis in Ukraine um, put the U.S.-Russia non nuclear non-proliferation uh, cooperation at stake? So um, it's an interesting question. The, 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 um, the dynamic between um, Russia and Ukraine uh, has not necessarily um, had an enormous effect on our nonproliferation cooperation with Russia because that cooperation had been uh, being reduced over the last several years. The, the, the government of Russia uh, has signaled that it wanted, um, that it saw less areas for cooperation with the United States on nonproliferation for the last two years. Um, in our heyday, in the 90s and early 2000, there was much more work that the United States funded in cooperation with the Russian, uh, with Russian institutes and experts on what we call nonproliferation and threat reduction uh, than today. Um, in fact, um, there's very little that is left. There are some legacy activities that the National Nuclear Security Administration here uh, in the United States does with um, uh, Russia, the Russian government, and there's some limited work that the Department of Defense does uh, with Russia. But that is on a scale that is far smaller. So um, Ukraine, I think, may have been a factor in some of the decisions uh, more recently on the U.S. side, but um, uh, I think has had a limited impact in what was already a very much reduced uh, relationship uh, with Russia. Now, that doesn't mean that um, we don't believe that there are current threats that, uh, that, uh, that are important to address in nonproliferation, but the fact of the matter is that uh, less work is being done in this area with Russia, between Russia and the United States. Mi Kyung Kim with Seoul Shinbun Daily Korea. Um, would you be more specific on how the ISTC has to do with the non-proliferation currently without Russia? I mean, we, you have cooperated uh, with Russia to stop proliferation for a long time. And without Russia, is it effective? I mean, for, I mean, thinking about the goal of the I, I, ISTC. And my second question is, um, after Russia left, the organization requires the new or more roles to the remaining members, like uh, Korea. And is we just uh, play as a funder, or we can have some benefit from this organization? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for, for the question. You ask a very good question. What is the impact of Russia leaving the ISTC? In our view, um, the impact is the most significant impact of Russia's departure is on Russian scientists and their technical experts. Uh, the ISTC is on a course, we believe, to expand to new countries uh, and continues to fund important work with uh, the current members of the ISTC. And as I described very briefly, uh, has worked with thousands of scientists and institutes in non-Russian uh, uh, countries um, uh, of the former Soviet Union uh, and continues to do so today. Um, and will do so in the future. The ISTC has very strong relations with a number of institutes in Georgia, Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. Um, and those have been good partnerships for institutes in other members of the ISTC, the Republic of Korea, Japan, the United States. For the United States, for example, our national labs are very heavily involved, uh, whether it's Los Alamos or uh, some of our other Department of Energy uh, labs. So. I, I think the, the impact was really more on Russia than it has been on the ISTC. Um, in terms of the Republic of Korea, the Republic of Korea has been a longstanding member of the International Science and Technology Center. Uh, it is a funder of the ISTC. Um, 
the, the Republic of Korea has enabled scientists from the former Soviet Union to participate in scientific cooperation and nonproliferation activities. Um, some of the projects that have been funded include important topics in energy, in agriculture, in medicine, in material science, in aerospace, in physics, and include both academic and government research institutions. I'll give you a specific example of what uh, Korea uh, has done. Every year, for example, Korea sponsors workshops at Korean institutes and invites 10 to 15 um, Georgian scientists and scientists from the central, from the CIS uh, countries to present their work on a wide range of topics. Last year, the topic was novel forms or new forms of sustainable energy production, and this year it will be nanotechnology. This helps to develop future collaboration between CIS Georgian laboratories and their Korean counterparts. Um, and I'll, if you'd like some numbers in terms of funding, up till 2013 and through, through 2013, so including 2013, the ICC reports that the Republic of Korea government has provided uh, $1,980,000 for projects and private Korean partners have provided $339,189. Um, so uh, the Republic of Korea is a very valued member of the ISTC and I think has demonstrated over the years its commitment to the organization and to its mission. Go ahead. Uh, okay. First of all, uh, forgive my ignorance, but <laughs> Uh, does this has anything to do with North Korea? I mean, does this has this done anything uh, related to North Korea? Does this plan to do anything related to North Korea? Uh, so, so, so currently, uh, no. Uh, the, the the ISTC um, funds projects and is responsive to um, the interests of its individual members and works in the countries that are members of the ISTC, so uh, there, there is no uh, focus on, on, on North Korea. But, but in terms of efforts to stop the spread of weapons of mass destruction, I think North Korea has long been accused of yes, spreading some missile and nuclear technology to countries like Syria and so. So that is a very real threat and a very real problem, but the ISTC as an organization has not focused on that particular threat. Do you so your name and publication? Yes, I'm uh, Iyame Olushuli. I'm from the Voice of America, Georgian Service. Uh, do you coordinate any efforts with law enforcement? Uh, yes, um, as I uh, had mentioned a little earlier, our um, the State Department has a number of non-proliferation programs, including a program that focuses on counter-nuclear smuggling, um, and that particular threat requires an interagency response. Um, and we work very closely with the Georgian government along with other countries that are partners in dealing with this particular threat and specifically with law enforcement in, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Georgia. Um, law enforcement has a very important role to play in breaking up and identifying smuggling networks. And there was, in particular, um, a case uh, that uh, uh, the Georgian government was helpful in addressing in 2010, um, where um, uh, we were grateful and appreciative of the fact that uh, there was a, 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 an apprehension of smugglers then. Um, now, we continue to work with the Georgian government. Uh, we have an agreement with the Georgian government where the United States State Department, Department of Energy, FBI, and other agencies work closely to strengthen uh, the Georgian government's ability to detect, prevent, and respond to the threat of proliferation. And we really we value that that partnership because the region itself is an important region for this issue. Mm -hmm. And where does the in the hierarchy of things or in the jurisdiction uh, where where do you stand um, as a you know in the whole picture? Yeah, you train people, you provide sure. assistance, but what is it that you do in particular that uh, network of smugglers is, is covering pretty well? 
So how do we we address that? Yeah, what's what's your role in that? Absolutely. So my specific focus is to oversee cooperative threat reduction programs. So they, we we don't. Um, um, the key word here being cooperative. We only work if a government wants to work with the United States and we provide assistance in areas that have been identified collaboratively between us and the United States, so, uh, or between us and the host government or the partner government. Um, typically, the areas where we supply training, equipment, and expertise, exchange best practices, help address particular threats, um, are in uh, border security, for example. Uh, where we will help countries develop detection uh, capability, either fixed capability, portal monitors at borders, at land crossings, uh, where um, we will work with our interagency to provide uh, portal monitors that uh, will identify potential material coming through trucks or vehicles. Um, at the State Department, we also provide handheld equipment to uh, enable border guards to do search and, and seizure of materials. Uh, we'll also work at ports, uh, all ports of entry, including uh, uh, seaports, uh, land ports, uh, airports. Um, the State Department also plays an important coordination role. So we will bring in, if we don't have expertise within the department, we'll bring in Homeland Security and others to help with that mission. Okay. We have time for one or two more questions. Are there any final? We'll <laughs> Uh, let me ask about, uh, could you speak, uh, the Japan's reprocessing policy? So my, my apologies, I, I'd love to, to, uh, to, to address, but unfortunately that's not within my purview. But yeah. I'd be happy to take is a there, question is back there to Is there any impact on the ISTC or the uh, there, There's no relation that, 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 I, that, okay. uh, that I can imagine. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate the question, and we can find a way to yeah. follow up. Yeah, thank you. OK, final yeah. question, I guess, then, to yeah, go ahead. Thank you. So you mentioned about the reduced cooperation between U.S. and Russia on the new uh, non-proliferation front. And since Obama administration uh, and Russia signed the new treaty on, on nuclear arms control, the new start, do you see it as a setback for the Obama administration on, the, on its second term in, in its cooperation with Russia and the way forward? Do you see, see cooperation for, uh, for the isolation of Russia? Uh, so, so I, I, I certainly don't see it as a setback for the the Obama administration. If I understand your uh, your question uh, related to the New Start agreement and the reduction in cooperation with Russia, the New Start agreement we see as positive as as a very important development uh, in the field of arms control and and a sign of leadership uh, between both countries in terms of redu reducing the world's most dangerous weapons. So I see that as a positive achievement. Um, that, in my mind, is different from the nonproliferation challenge, uh, where we uh, work to uh, together address what is a UN mandate, a UN uh, undescribed under UN Security Council 1540, which China, Korea, the United States, uh, and Russia uh, all support. Um, we, you know, we, we can't but deplore the fact that there's reduced cooperation because we continue to see threats that have evolved. As I mentioned earlier, the threats aren't necessarily state to state threats, but there are a number of threats posed by non state actors, whether it's ISIL or other groups that have an avowed interest in getting their hands on and using uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, it is important to have as many partners as one can. Uh, and having one less partner uh, or a partner that's perhaps less focused uh, on this area uh, is, um, is, uh, is, uh, is not a positive uh, development. But given the cooperation on Syria, do you still consider the cooperation between United States and Russia a reduced one? The uh, framework agreement that was uh, developed to remove uh, the Assad regime's declared uh, uh, chemical weapons arsenal was a historic achievement and was uh, uh, achieved in great part uh, by uh, 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 Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Lavrov and uh, our two governments working closely uh, together. Unfortunately, there still remains uh, a, a lot of work to do. We're still aware, as has been identified, of uh, continuing uh, chemical weapons attacks. Uh, 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 and the use of chlorine. Um, so there's still, um, I think, sitting back and seeing that as an achievement, I think, is would be misguided. It, it was an important achievement, but there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and it is the work of the international community. The 
effort to remove Syrian chemical weapons was not simply a U.S.-Russia effort. It was uh, the work of a number of uh, countries that participated either by funding uh, the work of the OPCW, providing ships like Denmark and Norway to remove the material from Syria, um, work by the United Kingdom uh, to eliminate uh, 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 Syrian chemical weapons, uh, limit, uh, to, 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 to destroy those weapons. Finland, many other countries participated. Uh, China participated uh, as well and, and deserves uh, an enormous amount of credit for participating in that removal operation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this, with that, uh, this event is now concluded. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>